Okay, in the third and final video for the week six Soccer 101 on Youth, I'm going to concentrate on youth transitions. So I've looked at kind of cultural practices um, in terms of leisure and um, uh, creativity and things like that. This is the more kind of social and economic, I suppose, um, perspectives on young people. Um, the idea of youth transitions here is that the, the period of youth that was once conceived of between 15 and 25 was this kind of transitional period from being a child to an adult, this kind of becoming um, liminal um, uh, uh, period of your life there where you kind of move from a child of not having responsibilities, of not having to look after yourself and all that kind of stuff, through to an adult where you have to do all that yourself. So youth studies um, researchers have tend to focus on three uh, areas of transition, the school to work trans transition, domestic transitions in terms of um, young people, you know, finding a partner and, and living with that person um, or getting married or getting into facto relationships or whatever. And the housing transition of kind of moving out of the parental home and finding your own place to live. So typically there was this kind of linear progression, I suppose. Um, probably never that linear, but like at least, you know, the imagined here in you know, the 50s and 60s was like you were born into the world in a particular place you would, you know, be socialised in a way that we've spoken about earlier in the course. But then, you know, you go to school, uh, you either then leave school and get a job or you go to university, get more education, then get a job. And then you kind of have that job for 30 or 40 years and then you retire. Uh, in the meantime there, you meet someone, you live with them, you have a family, you buy a house, you know, you do all that, then you retire and then you die. So that was kind of this linear idea of that progression from being a child to adult with those, many of those markers of adulthood being ticked off in the middle there. What most of the youth studies research has shown over the past couple of decades is really that linear transition is no longer the case, if it ever was, but certainly it's much more blurry, much more zigzag than it's ever been before. So why is it like that? It's kind of, well, life's more complex in many ways, and this is a relation to both more freedoms that are now kind of present in young people's lives, particularly, uh, you know, the work of feminism and stuff like that has opened up many uh, more opportunities for women that weren't around for previous generations but also because of a bunch of economic and social changes that have happened over the past couple of decades. Um, there's been upward credentialising of the labour market, which means you need more and more credentials to do jobs now that, like, previously you didn't really need them. Um, there's increased life expectancy, birth control, marriage and parenthood have all kind of changed in these times. Certainly the way that housing prices have rapidly risen compared to kind of the rather stagnant um, rate of pay. And the labour market in particular has become increasingly precarious. Um, heaps more casualised, fewer and fewer full-time jobs, more and more casualisation, precarity, short-term, gig economy kind of stuff. So what the youth studies research has tended to show is that period of, you know, say, you start becoming a youth from about 15, you're moving out of that child, and then, you know, you leave school, get a job, get married, and all that kind of stuff's ticked off by, say, 25 really is not the case anymore and much of those things that are kind of youth-like are happening further and further into the 30s and 40s and in fact many of those markers of adulthood aren't really being achieved by many people now you know many people aren't getting married they are um, choosing not to have kids or particularly with housing you know it's increasingly almost impossible for people unless from relatively privileged backgrounds to get a house particularly if you're living in metropolitan, met metropolitan places like Sydney and Melbourne. It's also, you know, in terms of those economic relations, the casualisation of the labour force means getting that full-time job is happening later and later and later. So this has kind of seen that youth transition period become more blurry, um, elongated, zigzag, kind of one step forward, one step back kind of thing, if you want to think about it in that kind of trajectory. So in terms of those demographic changes, you can click on that and check out some stats, but we know that the increased median age of first marriage and childbearing and leaving the family home is, is getting older and older. There's increasing rates of um, participation in higher education, increasing rates of women in the workforce, and hugely increasing rates of casualisation of part-time work. And there's decreasing rates of um, identifying with organised religion, and there's certainly decreasing rates of full-time work, and I'll discuss aspects of that in terms of detraditionalisation in, in a minute. So, what does this all this mean? Well, the kind of stuff throughout the 90s and early 2000s kind of showed how this was changing and what we see today is that young people kind of expect this kind of precarity more than previous generations in many ways. 
Um, it's much more normal now to kind of expect to have to retrain over and over again or keep getting educated or you know move around between different jobs rather than in the past where the expectation was much more like that kind of Weber bureaucracy kind of thing. You would get a job in a company and work your way up. Um, that's not so much the case anymore. So we can see these in a way of um, thinking about how transitions are kind of fractured in that sense, not straightforward, um, it's not linear. Young people are certainly having fewer children, happening having them later in life. Um, and so all these kind of symbolic markers of adulthood are happening later and later. And it's certainly the case too, because you know, things are much more expensive. So one of the things we need to consider here is that, um, you know, in terms of the moral panics I was talking about earlier on, there's stuff about, you know, eating too many avocados means you can't buy a house or people, young people are kind of bludging off their parents for longer and longer and staying at home. What you can see in these kind of media representations of these problems are like individualistic blame going on young people for making choices that aren't really there. They kind of um, scapegoat young people and they kind of um, are smoke screens for the actual intrinsic structural economic problems that are um, really re reflected in young people not being able to buy a house or having to stay at home for longer with their parents. So why has all this happened? There's been um, increased rates of participation since the World War II. Um, the economy has been you know, restructured and post-industrial kind of work has become more the norm. Um, and certainly kind of aspects of globalization that we'll look at in some detail later on um, has thoroughly affected the labor market in this way. Um, and you know, this increasingly you know, encouragement to kind of stay in education now, there's kind of debates over what this means. Certainly, jobs need more education, but like in terms of labour market figures, it could be that like having people in education systems actually gets them out of the kind of unemployment figures as well. So there's a whole bunch of different things to consider here, but like what we do know is that youth unemployment rates are always way more than the general rate. So it's only in recent decades that kind of youth kind of jobs or what's often called mc jobs have been a thing. Um, it's almost now like this kind of legislated discrimination in the labour market where there's certain jobs you're allowed to kind of pay young people less um, just because they're a certain age, regardless of what the skills are involved in that job. So, in terms of some of the kind of conceptual ways of thinking about this, um, in youth studies, the work of Beck and Giddens and a few others have been um, important for thinking about how this social, social change is affecting the lives of everybody, but particularly the lives of young people. So... We'll, I'll, I'll outline a little bit of Beck's ideas here, but we'll be more present when we do the week on environmental sociology later in the year. So Beck understands the world as a risk society. In essence, he's arguing we're moving from a class society to a risk society, where wealth and inequality used to be the key organisational principles of the previous way we live. Now risk is the key organisation organise, organising principle. So obviously wealth is still really important in terms of being able to insulate yourself for risks, but for Beck... There's now these kind of broad, hugely global risks that move beyond the ability of rich people to avoid them. And by that, he means things like, say, smog, uh, climate change, nuclear fallout, um, the risks of genetically modified food, all these kind of things, he argues, that even if you're quite risk, uh, rich, you're not necessarily shielded from those things. He talked about how smog is democratic. If you're living in a global city, you might be kind of a CEO that has the, you know, the the top office at the top of a 50-storey building, but you're breathing in the same smog as the cleaner that comes to clean that building. So for Beck, these kind of risks um, make class systems a little bit more blurry in terms of um, who gets exposed to what. For Beck means that we're all now kind of living a life of kind of engaging with risk, trying to minimise it as much as we can, try and make the right choices. And this happens particularly because many of the fixed sources of meaning that we've kind of been socialised with in the past such as religion, um, such as kind of, you know, marked gender roles, um, you know, and, and getting married early and all this kind of stuff has diminished. Um, even things like family patterns are being more and more accepted widely. The nuclear family is still kind of the most accepted, but there's more and more other versions of it that are accepted as well. And all these kind of change, changes of certainty, and particularly those related to globalisation, mean that we're kind of forced to deal with all these risks as individuals. Paradoxically, this means that it can actually involve some risk-taking behaviour. So what this means is a kind of left as these kind of previous understandings of kind of collective meaning disappear and we just kind of have to um, almost muddle together our own lives by making the right choices all the time. 
by being forced to make these choices, we therefore feel very anxious about them, and so we all lead very more, much more anxious, precarious existences. So for Beck, we're kind of encouraged to reflexively construct a shield against these risks, and young people in particular, I think, are a good object of study of how this happens, because young people are always at the forefront in, of, of social change. So they're not just risks in this sense like dangers to life, as you would ex maybe um, conceive of risks. It's not like the risk of you know, getting killed in the street or either these are obvious risks, but these are kind of more broad social risks. There's those large-scale global risks that I was just talking about, but then Beck talks about in our day-to-day -day lives, um, we need to kind of manage those everyday risks about um, you know, getting a real job, getting the right education, uh, meeting a partner that we want to live with. So for Beck, this becomes an individual project, um, and that things like class certainly still matter in terms of being shielded from some of these risks, but really um, risk becomes the key organising principle. Certainly being poorer attracts more risks. So in terms of young people, what does this mean? Um, much of the research shows that young people have a real kind of heightened anxiety about the future, seeing abundance of risks now, whether they're real or managed, or sorry, imagined. Um, and so this becomes a kind of way of being in that kind of liminal period between being a child and adult. Um, and we have to kind of deal with these risks in that period to try and set ourselves up to having a good life in the future. So, it, so Beck and others talk about what they call reflexivity. So as individuals now, rather than say maybe being born into the world, and if you say born as a young, born as a you know white male in a working class family in say Cessnock, really what your choices was kind of maybe to go and work in the mines and there's a few other choices. People maybe accept those roles and just not think too much about them and get on with it. Um, you know, I'm talking kind of idealised kind of 50s stereotype there or something. Um, Beck argues today that we're kind of freer in that sense from being born into the traditional roles, um, but um, this means that we then have to work on ourselves constantly to try and put our choices into practice. So this forces us to kind of turn inward, to focus on the self, and as the likes of Giddens points out, this has seen the growth of a bunch of different industries about working on the self to make yourself better, you know, life coaches, um, careers advisors, um, personal trainers, um, psychologists, you know, the list goes on. Increasingly, it's up to the individual to deal with all these different risks, both economic and social, um, and try and kind of become, perform a entrepreneurial kind of productive self. So reflexivity here means a couple of different things. There's like a feedback loop going on, um, the way that we're in the world. Um, and it happens at multiple levels, so we won't talk about this too much here, but like in the week, weeks on, in the week on environment, Beck talks about how modernity itself is now reflexive, that um, all the great kind of progressions that modernity produced is actually producing now those things that could actually wipe humans out. So industrial modernisation has led to, you know, burning of coal and that leads to climate change. So what happens now is modernity has to be reflexive about self and all these kind of sciences now have to discover new knowledges to try and minimise those risks. So there's a reflexivity going on in that kind of major level. In a more everyday life, we have to kind of be reflexive about the choices we make, um, whether to go and do a uni, uni degree or not, whether to get married or not, um, you know, whether to, to go to the gig and participate in a youth culture or not. We have to kind of make strategic decisions about these based on our lifestyle and based on what we want to get out of things. And this is reflected in consumption patterns and is also reflected in kind of things like career choices and stuff like that as well. In terms of bridging the gap between youth transitions and cultures, we can see how youth cultures are kind of places where young people go to kind of, in some ways, uh, relax a little bit from these kind of social pressures. This is all bound up in what Giddens has called detraditionalisation, and again, this is that idea that there's been a withering away of those old social collectivities and associated norms of behaviour. So things like place, kinship, religion, social class, even gender, these things still really matter to people, but they become more about things we can associate through um, forms of self-identity rather than necessarily being imposed upon us. Um, so this means, again, the self becomes a reflexive project for us to work on. Now, there's a lot of critique of this kind of pers perspective. It seems, that, um, in many ways, the, the reflexive person that Giddens and Beck talk about is a relatively privileged white person, 
um, that kind of are free from the actual marginalizations and discriminations of race, gender, and class. But I think what they do have to say does apply, I think, uh, more broadly in terms of the way that we live as well. So it's not an either or thing there. It's certainly we can criticize these perspectives from race, class, and gender perspectives in terms of the inequalities about who can be um, put their reflexive kind of choices into practice more than others. But I think they do have some interesting and accurate things to say about kind of everyday subjectivity. So these processes lead to these individualization that I was kind of um, hinting on earlier. We're left in this kind of risky world to make decisions, to put choices into practice, and all we can do to kind of engage with those risks is to rely on the information in front of us, to rely on our experiences, to get advice out of experts and all that kind of stuff. But the problem with all that is we uh, constantly hit with kind of contradicting information. Um, you know, one day red wine is good for you, so you might have a bit of that because it'll be healthy for your circulation and next week it's like bad for you and gives you heart disease or something. So again, we kind of increasingly understand that science provides us with knowledge but not truth. Um, and we have to kind of then make up our practices and the way that we perform our everyday self based on this contradictory information all the time. So one person will tell you to go and do a, I don't know, a nursing degree because there's jobs there. Another person might say, don't do that. It's not very well paid. You should you know, do something else or whatever, right? So there's all these kind of different conflicting advice and all we can do as individuals is take on that information, make choices the best we can. But we kind of know that um, there's a lot of precarity and anxiety in, get involved in that. Who knows if we're right or not? Um, and that can lead to kind of problems in the future. So making the right choice in all the choices that we make creates pressure and we live in this kind of reflexive, anxious state. Some of the work I've done earlier on in, in this kind of area kind of talks about how class plays a real role in kind of um, the dissemination of these risks as well. So you can check out some of that work there. So in terms of youth studies, um, the work of you know, Beck and Giddens has been a kind of way of situating a lot of social change, been thoroughly critiqued in lots of ways as well, like I mentioned. And certainly, you know, there's been a, um, I think that the, the really interesting work in youth studies, you know, looks at kind of inequality differences around things like class and race and ethnicity. Um, and certainly geographical location, the problems, you know, different problems that young people have in the city as opposed to the suburbs or in terms of um, rural places. Um, so uh, there's lots of research you can look at for that. There's some in the course guide, and if you have a particular area of interest, you can send me an email. I can give you some advice about where to look for good stuff. Um, there's been a really excellent study going on in Australia for a couple of decades now called the Life Patterns Project. So you can um, have a look there. It's run out of the Youth Research Centre in Melbourne. Um, and they've been doing an amazing project that's been kind of tracking young people since the 90s as they get older and they do a different kind of generation, each iteration of the project, um, and shows many of the kind of things I've been talking about um, in the lecture so far about the kind of blurry zigzag nation, uh, notion of um, transitions. So have a look at that. Um, and Julia Cook, who you've been hearing from in the course, has been um, working on that project as well. So to, uh, to sum up, um, just to draw together what I've been talking about today, um, there's been this kind of culture and transitions sides of youth studies. Transitions tended to focus on work and education opportunities, deviance and so on. Culture tended to focus on the, you know, subcultures, consumption, leisure practices, art, creativity. Um, but in more recent times, it's been pointed out that um, having those things separate is kind of a false dichotomy in many ways. Um, young people don't lead kind of separate lives where they do transitions here and cultures there. And really, we need to kind of bring those two things together to understand the lives of young people. So... You know, there's been arguments that transition studies need to kind of pay more attention to what young people are doing in their cultural lives and vice versa. So um, there's a really good collection on that that I've got a chapter in if you want to check that out as well. Okay, so um, if you're interested in the topic of youth more generally, we have a specific subject that's on it. So if you've got um, a room as an elective or you're doing a sociology major, please check this one out. It runs every second semester. It's online only, so I run it, but... Um, it's basically the first kind of four or six weeks are uh, kind of based on the research that the youth um, network does here that I'll talk about in a minute. And then the last couple, last four or five weeks of me interviewing youth studies uh, researchers about their work. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can get in touch or you can just enrol in it in second semester.
And as you can probably tell, youth studies is my area of research. It's the thing that I'm kind of most enthusiastic about. I do kind of um, research about class and inequalities in young people's lives. Um, but we have a, a, a group of researchers here called the Newcastle Youth Studies Network. Um, and you can check out the work of those researchers there um, if you're interested in this topic further. Okay, thanks.